If no, then let's go ahead. Why get why ban get materials? I, I uploaded some paper. Uh, they are pretty uh very uh what is it called uh important paper, right? Many people refer to this. The first two papers is about gallium nitride. The last paper is about uh, the general ultra wideband gap device, okay? So this is a simple slide, but I'm going to spend a lot of time. I want you to understand every items. And so please pay attention, right? Um, what is ultra wideband gap? What is band gap, right? What is the band gap of silicon? Anyone remember? 1.12. 1.12. Okay, good. 1.12 EV. A very narrow band gap. It's not really narrow, actually. Germanium is even more narrow, 0 0.66. You know, germ germanium was the first device transistor to make, to prove to be useful. But eventually, it got abundant. That is because it has a narrow band gap. What's the problem of having a narrow band gap? Tunneling. Say again. <clears throat> Is it because of tunneling? Like, uh... Because of tunneling. Good. Right? Remember that, for example, band to band tunneling? What is that? Do you still remember? Right. All what we have learned now pay off because the electron from the valence band will tunnel to the conduction band, right? And then you generate current in reverse bias. I hope you still remember on the left, is it N-type or P-type? If this is a reverse bias on the left, is it N-type or P-type? P-type. Say again. So first of all, on the left, do I apply positive or negative bias in order to draw this band diagram? Negative bias. Negative. So how can negative bias be reversed? Uh, should it be N-type or P-type? P-type? P-type, right. And that makes sense because reverse, you try to push the electron to the right. The problem is this P-type, I don't have too much electron here, very few. Same for here, I don't have much hole because this is N-type. So you should be uh, giving me zero current, very small current, right? But when the bias is large enough, I get band-to-band -band tunneling. The whole the, the electron in the valence band tunnel to here. It is more, more severe if the gap is smaller. Right? You just imagine if the gap is zero, it is really narrow. It's very easy to tunnel. It go up exponentially, band to band tunnel, right? Another thing is impact ionization, right? Anyone want to volunteer and explain to everyone again, right? I draw the picture here. What is impact ionization? Anyone still remember? We just did that actually in the exam. Right? I also know actually not all of us can answer it perfectly. But what is impact ionization? Same band diagram, same structure. What is that? What happened? Uh, the accumulation of holes. Say again. Uh, there's accumulation of holes. Accumulation of holes. Maybe uh, you want to use more... Uh, proper word. So what, what happened now, I apply a negative bias and positive bias here. What happened? What happened to the electron? Let's say I have an electron here. What happened to this electron when I have a negative bias on the left? It, it will try to move forward to the right and yeah. it will lose energy. And then when it loses energy, mm -hmm. it, it will create a uh, it will create um, a hole, an electro, uh, a pair, an electron hole pair, and then it will try to regain the energy and then go up again and then repeat the process. Yeah. So it will move 
if you doesn't lose energy, if energy keep higher, this is a cliff, right? If I do, don't lose my energy, I run my car over the cliff, my actually potential energy is really high after I go over the cliff. And then, but, but this is not a very exact analogy, but then I lose my energy, I go down. This is the energy di band diagram, right? I go down, then what happened? I can lock off another electron from the valence band. Then I generate an electron hole pair. The energy I lose must be larger than the band gap, right? If the energy I lose is smaller than the band gap, I cannot generate electron hole pair, correct? If I have a very large band gap, then it means it's more difficult, right? to have impact ionization. Well, is this a big deal? It's a very important thing, especially in military and space application. There are lots of, uh, not, there's a lots of particle over there, radiative particle, alpha particle, uh, neutron, high energy neutron, muon, whatever. They, they just need a shower sh going into the earth, but they got blocked by the atmosphere. If your transistor is at off state, one particle hitting your junction is going to generate electron hole pair. If you have a wide band gap, it's more difficult to generate. And if you have wide band gap, even if it is generates, it's more difficult to avalanche, to create a secondary particle to cause the avalanche process. So it will be more stable, right? You know about Silence. Silence is a FPGA company. They keep testing their FPGA under radiation. Why? Because the FPGA nowadays rely on SRAM to store the state. SRAM is a memory. If they go got radiation uh, strike, it can flip the bit. And once it flips a bit, then the whole circuit is wrong, right? You only need to have one bit wrong to screw up everything. So they test it on ground level. Like if you look at their paper, right? I also went to some conference, they present their paper. They will compare their paper on sea level, the paper on the elevator level, let's say Lake Tahoe. The failure rate will be larger when it is on Lake Tahoe, right? For the military, for the Air Force, they care about this a lot, okay? So this is related to the wideband gap. So at this point, maybe let me say one more thing. How about I increase the temperature? If I increase temperature, I will be also able to generate more electron hole pair because higher temperature means I have what? Do you still remember the Fermi direct distribution? We spent a lot of time on that. You if it is at low temperature, you have a distribution like this. If you have a high temperature, you can have a distribution like this. As a result, you have a lot of high energy electrons. That is high enough to get excited to the valence band, a conduction band. So you have a lot of leakage, but more importantly, if it is a memory, what happened? Maybe you have, I don't know if you've learned about dialect DRAM. DRAM is so critical nowadays, right? It's like the competition between Samsung, Micron, and there was a, a shortage of DRAM a few years ago because of all this machine learning and server. All this DRAM, you need to refresh them. If they have more leakage, then it means you need to refresh them even faster, right? And of course, you, you can also flip their bit by radiation. If I have a wider band gap, it will be more difficult to generate this electron hole pair. So it is good, smaller leakage. And that's why germanium didn't work well. It was more mature in terms of technology in 1950. But then once they fix the technology of silicon, everything switched to silicon because germanium is just too leaky. Even nowadays in early 2000, there was a 
re renaissance of the germanium because they provide a higher hole mobility but they are still quite limited one reason is the small band gap okay so we have been using silicon for a long time you see if you have large band gap less band to band tunneling less leakage i can scale more right but this is not related to wide band gap i have less leakage less impanalization what, what we also call is more radiation hot, red hot. You will hear this one pretty often. I know one of you were in Norfolk Gurman. Right? And this property will come up every day because they provide, they make the equipment for the military. You don't want people just to do some radiation and then all your military equipment just die on the spot. Right? No matter how good it is, all the electronics just fail. So radiation hot is important. And high temperature. If I put silicon into a chip that operates at 200, no matter how good te your technology, technology is, they are just a bunch of resistors. They are all very leaky. Then how I'm going to have a chip operate in high temperature and high pressure? Oil drilling or aircraft? I want to sense, I want to have a sensor to sense the engine, whether it is operating uh, normally. I need to do it early. I, I cannot put silicon there, it's too hot, right? And also uh, space exploration, whatever. Uh, you go to the Mars, when you face the sun, it can be super hot. Your silicon just doesn't work, right? So that's why we have wide band gap material. And currently there are two groups of material. One people like to call wide band gap because before that, we only pay attention to this gallium nitride and silicon carbide. Their band gap is 3.4 and 3.43 EV, three times. Is that a big deal three times? It is because all this mechanism depends exponentially on the band gap, as we have seen before. Fermi direct distribution, band to band tunneling, impact ionization, they all depend exponentially. So what type of concept is that? At room temperature, silicon has about one, if this is undoped, it has about one to the power 10 electron hole pair due to Fermi generation. Means there are 10 billion electron per cm cube. But for gallium nitride and silicon carbide, can you guess how much electron we have at room temperature due to this thermal generation? Anyone want to guess? Uh, 10 to the seven. 10 to the seven. 1,000 times lower, right? But no, you are wrong. I, sorry, I happily to say that we rob you. I want to exaggerate it, right? I, you are, I'm not trying to criticize you. Thanks for answering. It's 10 to the power minus 20. 30 orders of magnitudes different. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe 10, but at least 20 to 30 orders of magnitude. It is so small that when we do the TCAS simulation, people start to challenge, say that, such a low concentration, does it make sense? In one cm cube, you have 10 to the power 30 electron or 20 electron, right? It doesn't make sense. It means no electron. And then we say, you don't know, you, do you know if you put the uh, device uh, under the sun or just in your room, once in a while, there will be an alpha particle hitting it, right? In your body, the same. There's alpha particle everywhere in your room. Once in a while, one will hit hit it. This alpha particle is going to generate an electron hole pair. It is way more than the intrinsic carrier concentration, which is 1 e minus 20. Okay, so I forgot the exact number, so I don't put here, but really not just 1000 times less. It's 10 to the power 20, 20 zero less. Okay, so this is very uh, extreme, right? This is the so-called wide band gap. But after many years of development, now we are not satisfied with that. We want to something even wider, ultra wide band gap. 
this is what we have been talking about. Diamond, you might be very surprised. Well, diamond, uh, we didn't know that diamond can be a semiconductor. Diamond is nothing but just replace all silicon by carbon. It's just the nat natural uh, crystal of carbon, just like silicon. They have the same crystal structure, but they have small atom, they're very wide band gap. Gallium oxide, 4.9 EV, also very wide, okay? Aluminum nitride can go to 6 EV. This is the so-called ultra wide band gap that people actively pursue now. Wide band gap, people have spent many years, even as early as 1960, right? I was just uh, attending a conference, a professor from University of Kyoto, he was playing with silicon carbide, but was not successful. They were not good, able to grow very high quality silicon carbide. It has a lot of defects. And that stopped them from growing. And he also said, actually silicon carbide came earlier than silicon. But again, people went to silicon just because of the defect. Okay, but nowadays they are mature. So you, you just Google, you go to job fair, you see wolf speed, Right, this is some company you want to pay attention. Woosby is in the US. They produce silicon carbide. They do LED, right? And you can uh, you can find, and they actually are part of Creek before they spin up. So you go to Home Depot. When you buy LED, it's often Creek. The same company produce nowadays also silicon carbide power device. Gallium nitride. If you ever seen anyone sell you an adapter, and it's much smaller than usually what you have for your iPhone, for your uh, uh, laptop charger, is probably they use gallium nitride. They can reduce the form factor a lot. I won't discuss here. Uh, I can tell you uh, because gallium nitride can operate at higher speed and also they lose, they have less heat consumption. So you don't need a lot of heat sink. At the same time, high speed, it don't need very large inductor and capacitor. So you can have a very small device. And that's why now that you see all these small USB type of adapter, right? In the past, you cannot imagine, right? You will see more and more in the market, right? Another big thing, gallium nitride and gasoline carbide, carbide are already in the cars. Um, which company? What is that? the Tesla? They use exclusively silicon carbide for their converter and inverter because it is much more energy efficient. It saves a lot of weight. Now I say because they operate higher speed than silicon, so they can use smaller inductor. They have less heat uh, consumption, a heat, less heat generation dissipation. So they even don't need the water coolant. That saves a lot of space and energy. Right, so you see, test the bet on this, and looks like they are successful. Okay, now they many cars still using silicon IGBT. Okay, so that is the first introduction for band gap. They are why. Okay, now we just talk about quality. This is the important. Now you will see that they actually have something called dislocation. For silicon, we don't have silicon. is very nice. We have the best technology for silicon, right? We can purify it. The whole world spent 50, 60 years, both in Soviet Union and now, now the Russia and United States, Japan, Eastern Europe country, Western Europe, they spent really decades to purify silicon. We know it very well. But for this wide band gap material, they still have a lot of defect, but good enough for us to commercialize it. We doesn't, don't have to be perfect. But this have, is going to impose some constraint. But we cannot go into detail, for example, silicon carbide. You will try to avoid to operate in bi bipolar mode because it will create some so-called basal plane defect when you have minority carrier injection, right? Very complicated, but just know that we do have this problem. Another interesting thing, do you know what is the state of the art of the wafer nowadays for silicon? For silicon, now what type, what is the size of the wafer? 18 inches. 18? Not yet. <laughs> oh, 16 then. 16 is the next big goal, yes. 
But at oh. this moment, it's mostly 12 inch. But you're right, 16 inch is the next goal, but still have not picked up. Not because all the infrastructure from the crystal formation to your machine, and also how do you handle such a big wafer without breaking it is very difficult. But anyway, now it's 12 inch. Now you look at all of this, diamond one inch. Well, that's pretty natural, right? If I can make a really big diamond cheaply, I actually would just sell it instead of doing semiconductor, right? <laughs> I just sell, 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 or buy one for my wife. That would probably is more meaningful, right? This two inch, four inch, right? Silicon carbide is relatively mature, but most of them still operating in six inch. If you look at news, they will say, Oh, Wood Split and Infineon, they align a fab with six inch and they're going to supply wafer to each other for how many wafer per month, also at six inch. Eight inch is more still in the research, right? Silicon nitride, you need to be careful. It means on eight inch silicon, this is very interesting. Gallium nitride substrate is very expensive, just like diamond, okay? So what do they do? They will just put it on the silicon. Well, silicon, we have all the infrastructure. I just deposit gallium nitride on top. And then I have a gallium nitride device. But what is the problem? Can you guess? Why not everyone just do that? We have plenty of cheap silicon wafer, right? And I can let you know many companies, for example, TSMC and UMC. In Taiwan, we have the two of the largest, uh, two of the two of uh, two very big foundry. They were competing against each other, but eventually UMC lost. And then they start stopping developing all the things we discussed earlier, FinFed, whatever. But they don't close. They shift the direction to ultra wide band gap. So what do they do? They have a lot of eight inch silicon wafer and they have all the, all the equipment. All they need to do just figure out how to put this material on top of it. Then can they can provide this service to this wide band gap uh, people, right? What's the problem of depositing gallium nitride on silicon? Can you guess? You might not be able to guess, but anyone want to try? Why don't I just put a gallium nitride crystal on top of silicon? Why Say again? Heat transfer. Heat transfer, okay. That can be a very useful, that is one reason. Uh, but Capacitance, one more thing. Crystal, crystal shape. Great, yes. It's the crystal, right? All you're saying, capacitor or heat transfer, they are related. But the most important is they have lattice mismatch. They don't have the same crystal and they don't have the same Uh, what do you call crystal lattice constant? So how can I make it a crystal? I need to stretch them. Once I stretch them, they're in string and then eventually crack, right? And that's why you have so much threading dislocation. So for this type, when we say 1E4 here, it's actually talking about gallium nitride on gallium nitride. If you want to have gallium nitride on silicon, it's in the order of 1E8. It means 100 million defect fretting dislocation in 1 cm square. Pretty scary. But somehow it works. I won't go into details because some of the fretting dislocation are not electrically active. But indeed, if you are electron, you go in, you see so many fretting dislocation that stop you from moving. Okay, so that is one thing. Now let's go back to the temperate thermal conductivity you just mentioned. Indeed, these all have very good thermal conductivity, especially for diamond. It is very good. Remember, we use ultra wideband gap for power device. It operates high temperature, high voltage. It generates a lot of heat. So if we can use diamond, that would be perfect. Right? Remember the SOI we discussed? When you increase the heat, what happened to the mobility? Do you still remember? If the temperature increase, what happened to the mobility? Increase. Increase. Mobility. Go down. Go down. It slow you down, right? 
because you have so much uh, movement of the lattice, it just stops you from moving. Remember, we increase the temperature of the lattice, not increasing the temperature of the electron. Of course, electron temperature will go up also. It's just like you're running through a hole. All the people standing there still, you can run really quickly just through those uh, channels. But suddenly they start vibrating, you're going to scatter by some of them, and then you stop and then you run again. Okay. Silicon has about 100 watt per meter per Kelvin. So you see gallium nitride, silicon carbide, aluminum nitride, diamond, they're all better than silicon. So they were good thermal conductivity, except this one is bad. Gallium oxide is really bad. 11 to 27, one fifth or less, or even less than silicon. So this is a problem of that, right? But why, why people look at gallium oxide, wide band, ultra wide band, gamma also, somehow this one stand out for, it's very easy to grow their nitride, get their substrate, it's cheap. And that is important for mass production, right? We know diamond is good, right? But we also know diamond is too expensive. Of course, this is grow by chemical vapor deposition. It's not like you do milding, you do mild in South Africa or whatever to get those big diamonds, right? Okay, so I hope you have this picture, right? I can only talk. Uh, if you listen, you have it, then you learn more in the future. I'm not going to ask you to say this in the uh, exam, right? But this is what you need to learn, this, right? Another problem is, because they're wide band gap, now the dopen, we talk about incomplete ionization. Remember, for silicon, well, there is incomplete ionization in assignment four, in assignment three, I gave you phosphorus, maybe I forgot how, you play with the level, right? For, for usually you have 45 mini EV, well, still pretty okay. In wide band gap, because they are so wide, it's very difficult to find a dopant that's so, so, so close to the valence bands or so close to the conduction band. You actually have some gap. For example, in diamond, boron is almost 0 0.3 EV. Think about that in silicon. For 0 0.3 EV, we call it a deep trap, right? But in diamond, right? For example, not, mm, uh, Let's say phosphorus. Uh, uh, okay, I forgot the number. Let me just use boron, right? Boron to the conduction band, to the valence band. 0 0.3 EV, right? This is conduction band. This is valence band, right? And this is the trap level of boron or more. Okay. So it is not good, right? So if you look at that, you see get them. Nitride is still pretty okay. It has some pretty good P doping and N doping. Silicopa is also good, but they have deeper trap, but still okay. Some of them like get them outside. We don't have any P doping, right? No one have done it uh, experimentally. Using at initial theoretical calculation, it has been proved that having P type do doping is impossible, right? But there might be improvement in the future. But now all gallium oxide are N-type though. So it is junctionless. Diamond, you have both. P-type is more difficult. N-type is more difficult. Gallium nitride is opposite. Or oh, because it's too wide, 6 EV. All of them are poor, but N-type is better. But we need to be creative. Find a way to create the electron and hope, right? This won't stop us because they have some merits that silicon doesn't have. Okay, so that's a general introduction to wide band gap. Do you have any questions? Or comment? Professor, state of the art substrate diameter that you explained just now is basically the size, uh, is the maximum size, right? That we can yeah, yeah, you work. can say that at the maximum size people have tried to demonstrate. Beyond but, that, uh, it basically breaks or something. Beyond that, no one had uh, 
uh, the resources to demonstrate. For example, you cannot find a six inch, 12 inch wafer and deposit because they just don't want to demonstrate it's too, uh, not just break. Yeah, you, good point there. Many things maybe break or maybe it is not uniform. When we say it works for eight inch, then it means you really can put the, utilize the whole wafer. So when you're very large, maybe the uh, most of the area are not working. You only have a center part working after the fabrication. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And some of them you just cannot grow. For example, you cannot grow more than one inch for diamond. Uh, just like what you say, maybe break or it will take a year to grow or something. It's not feasible. And for purpose, like, uh, is it uh, like in industry, uh, do they use gallium, gall uh, aluminum gallium nitrate? Yeah, this one may be something confusing to you. When we say gallium nitride, later we're going to study, we have something called barrier. It actually have a aluminum gallium nitride barrier on top of it. But the transport is mostly in the gallium nitride. When we talk about aluminum gallium nitride, we may we have a device with the transport inside aluminum gallium nitride. So now this one is not in the industry, it's still in the research lab, right? Like Sandia lab, right? They do a lot of this. In the industry, it is gallium nitride in production, and they do have aluminum gallium nitride on top of it. You will we will study this later, but this one we call it gallium nitride because the transport, the electron they all confine inside this gallium nitride instead of running through this, this part. Is that okay? Uh, yes, Professor, thank you. So yeah, so in my opinion, this uh, among ultra wideband gap, gallium oxide is the most mature and popular one at this time. Diamond is catching up. And this one aluminum nitride really, really at the starting point. Right, they, they just demonstrate something, but a lot of problem, and did not generate too much interest yet. Now, just my opinion, I can be wrong. Okay, so when we talk about the ultra wideband gap, the most important thing is breakdown. Okay, so what is breakdown? What is breakdown voltage of a device? Right, the breakdown is that I was in off state. Right, I have a device, I make it in off state, I turn it off, for example, VG equal to zero, right? Or let's do something simpler. Let's just say, for example, the PN junction is reverse bias. And then I apply high voltage, right? Eventually something has to happen. And that is breakdown. What is breakdown? It means the currents will go up. So if I plot the log level of the current versus the voltage, at the beginning, it, there's no current, it's all noise. And certain voltage, suddenly you see something like this. And this is the breakdown voltage. Usually we call it VBR, it increased by orders of magnitude, maybe from 1E minus 12 all the way to 1E minus 5, seven orders of magnitude within a very tiny range of voltage. This is breakdown, right? What is the mechanism? I just explained earlier. The mechanism, right? See previous slide. Can you remind me what are the mechanisms that we have talked about for breakdown? Impact ionization and band to band. Impact ionization, very good. Now, band to band is also one of them, but usually it won't happen. So in this slide, we don't talk about band to band. Band to band occurs usually you have very heavy little PN junction. So sometimes we deliberately do that. That is like center dial, right? So you can claim the voltage at a certain value. But in panelization, 
is something that because of the generates of generation of the electron, then you generate whole pair, right? Electron, and then it becomes electron whole pair, right? And here you become four, two electron whole pair. You just keep going up, four electron whole pair. Right, you just keep multiply, multiplication. Okay, so in TCAT, what do we do? In TCAT, basically, you have something called avalanche. If you turn on your physics, in the physics, and you say recombination, because it's a part of generation and recombination model, right? In TCAT Centaurus. And then you turn on avalanche. Then it's going to turn on this model, okay? It's going to have some generation rate based on something called impact ionization, ionization integral coefficient, sorry. I forgot, actually I forgot the exact name. Ionization coefficient. First of all, just ask yourself, right? Even I have very large electric field, if I don't have the initial electron, am I going to have breakdown? Actually difficult, more difficult, right? Unless you go to super high electric field, you just strip off the electron directly due to the electric field, but very difficult. You always need to something to initiate it. And that means you need the current, right? It's just like in the real avalanche in the snow mountain. If there's no snowball to start rolling, you might not have avalanche. Usually it's at a certain point you have some snowball start rolling. Then because of this multiplication effect plus this times this ionization coefficient, you start have more generation and they can keep fit, fitting back. Okay. You don't need to memorize this equation, even no need to put in your, in your cheat sheet. But I want to show you is that this ionization integral depends on what? Depends on the electric field you apply. You have a high electric field, what happened? I hope that you start learn how to read this type of equation. This is in denominator. When electric field increase, the whole term will decrease. But when the whole term decrease, this is negative. This becomes less negative. So when it's less negative, exponential of less negative actually will increase. So if you increase the electric field, you increase the ionization coefficient. So you have more generation, right? This is generation of electron hole pair, okay? And then it has some parameter, for example, gamma depends on this. You can ignore it. But I want, to, want you to see that the B is dependent on the band gap, just like what I said earlier. But how does it depend? It depends linear, linearly. However, if you plug into this equation, it becomes depends exponentially on the band gap. So your generation due to impact ionization increase exponentially if you have a smaller band gap. Let's see if that is correct, smaller. When EG is smaller, B is smaller. When B is smaller, this term is smaller, but the negative term becomes larger. So exponential becomes larger. So you have more ionization. So G increases, right? Smaller B, larger G. Is this okay? So basically this is why I want to say EG increase, then B will increase, and then alpha will increase, and then GII will increase. Okay. Just go back to what we said, uh, what if the temperature increase? What if the temperature increase? This is a little bit complicated. I can go over with you. 
one more time, right? So let's start with the blue color. When this temperature increase, what happened to this whole term? Maybe you don't know why it's tension, but it just go together with the argue argument. So this term increase, the whole thing increase. So this one increase. So what happened to gamma? When the denominator, denominator increase, what happened to gamma? You will decrease, right? So this one will decrease. Alpha will decrease. G will decrease. Hmm? Right? So when temperature increase, gamma in decrease. So generation will decrease. So actually, it has less impact ionization. Why is that? That is because if you remember for impact ionization, you need to run through here. But if you have a lot of temperature, you keep losing energy to the lattice. So before you have enough energy to generate the electron hole pair, you go down already. And then when you keep accelerating and you go down again before you have enough energy. So that's why this is how people in experiment to check if the process is impact ionization. Again, this is log i, this is v. So it may break down at this point. Let's say temperature equal to 100, let's say 300 Kelvin. And if you keep going, there may be temperature equal to 400 Kelvin. Right? Then this is impact ionization. This is the breakdown voltage, right? So the breakdown voltage keep increasing when you increase the temperature. Is this okay? Any questions? I might be too slow, but uh, any question on this? Okay, so the characteristic of impact ionization is that when you increase temperature, the breakdown voltage increase. Now you understand what is breakdown voltage? It's just when you do this prop, the current suddenly come up. That is the breakdown voltage. Okay, here I also show you something rule of flum. Critical electric field is the electric field at which you have this breakdown voltage. It is proportional to the gap, band gap square. So you have wide band gap, like three times, for example, when your gallium nitride is about three times the band gap of silicon, the electric field you need to break it down is about 10 times larger than silicon. And that is what makes wide band gap material so robust. We call it robustness, okay? So this is the first concept about wide band gap, breakdown voltage, how it is related to band gap. Second concept is that if you have a very high breakdown voltage, it will be useless if you cannot conduct current, right? I just 